Keith. Thanks for, yeah. Um, so I think Cargill is one of those companies that everyone says, yeah, I've heard of them. And then you say, what do they do? And people go, ah, I'm not sure. Um, so I described you as a hub. Just unpack that. Tell us a bit about what you do. And tell us one thing I'm particularly interested in is as a, as a hub in this network, how are you able to, to sort of leverage your influence to, to push out sustainability practices? Yeah, thanks. So Cargill is a privately owned company. We're 155 years old, which is actually quite remarkable. Um, we have um, 160,000 employees. We operate in 70 countries around the world. And we have the privilege to operate in some of the most critical supply chains as it relates to sustainability. So palm, soy, cocoa, beef, certainly row crops in North America and South America. Um, but all around the world, we connect producers and farmers and ranchers with consumers through food ingredients companies or through food, food manufacturing companies. And so, as you can appreciate, that's a pretty critical role and a pretty critical point to play. Um, this question about, okay, so we sit in a critical place, how do we influence, how do we impact others up and down that supply chain? And we really believe that the power is in the partnerships that we're able to create. Um, there is no one entity that can change the approach, but we certainly, working together through, collaborative, through a collaborative approach, can bring innovation, can bring new effort, can bring new insights to, in the end, have a significant impact on food and agriculture and how our food is produced, the ability that we have to feed the world, um, and increasingly, we're seeing that agriculture is how we're gonna solve some of the problems that you talked about earlier. Right, so let, let's dig into one of those problems. Um, so we hear a lot about beef production and consumption. Um, I mentioned the WRI report, that's just one of many reports that charted a course to a sustainable future in which we eat dramatically less beef. Mm -hmm. um, kind of running in parallel with that, we're seeing some really interesting research coming out showing that if we change the way the beef ranches operate, we can dramatically lower the carbon footprint of beef. And in fact, we're, you know, you're even hearing talk, and this is you know, backed up by evidence, that, that beef could be a carbon negative product, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I'm really intrigued to, to what's the kind of thinking inside Cargill on that yeah, debate. Yeah. So um, we produce beef uh, and beef products in North America. We don't operate a beef business anywhere else in the world. We have a joint venture with a company in, Argent or in Australia that are a significant player in the beef supply chain. Um, and I don't know about you guys, I love my hamburger from time to time, not every day, but periodically. Um, and so how do we think about the fact that uh, beef is a really high quality protein, but we wanna produce it in the most sustainable way possible? What we know is that beef production in North America is already 35% more efficient than beef production anywhere else in the world. So we have a head start in North America. And then we've recently announced a program that we call Beef Up, which is um, an effort that we have consistent with our scope three carbon um, emission commitments um, to reduce the emissions in our beef supply chains by 30% by 2030. And we plan to do that through working with farmers and ranchers, working on better and more efficient grazing practices, better and more efficient um, row crop production practices for the feed and the feed ingredients that go into cattle feed. Um, also through new innovations. We have an animal nutrition business that's working on feed additives that, that cattle um, and dairy cattle can consume that will reduce the methane emissions that come from the burping that cattle do. Um, and then there's gonna be new innovations. And so we also welcome farmers and ranchers as well as other entities, whether it's NGOs, experts in the space, to come together around the table, kind of in this collaborative partnership approach, to say what's new. We don't see all of the solutions today, but what we see we're working to apply as effectively as we possibly can. I think the one last thing is it's really important to note that beef is, we need to find a solution to how to produce beef in a more sustainable way, and we're committed to that. 
But animal protein will be, continue to be an important part of many, many people's diets around the world, not just beef, but other animal proteins as well. And so that has to be on the plate, if you will, in addition to the fact that we need to look at and we are investing in alternative proteins. So whether that's plant-based proteins, whether that's um, cellular-based meat production, looking at all of those options. Because ultimately, agriculture is how we're gonna feed a growing planet. You know the number that we talk about is between nine and 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. Um, and we need to be able to feed people within planetary boundaries. So if you put all that together, that's a, some really interesting work you're doing. Where do you think it takes us? You know, let's jump forward 2030, 2040. We're moving hopefully to this more sustainable future. Are we, are we eating less beef as part of that? Or do you think those technologies can come on and allow us to consume at the levels we're at now? Yeah, it's fun to think forward and think about what's possible. Um, I think it will be a combination. I think we will perhaps consume less beef, but I also know that because the population is going to grow, the total protein consumption will continue to increase. Um, but I know and I believe very deeply that whatever we consume, whether it's beef or chicken or pork or even fish and how we think about aquaculture, as well as all the fruit and vegetable crops, all of those things, I believe, will be produced more um, sustainably than they currently are today. Not because farmers and ranchers don't want to do the best thing that they can for the planet, but because we are going to continue to develop and deploy new technologies, new approaches, new innovations. Got it. So let's talk about another big challenge, greenhouse gases. Mm. Um, so Cargill recently announced some targets on this front. Uh, a 10% reduction, absolute reduction in scope one and two emissions by 2025. Uh, and a 30% reduction by 2030 uh, in scope free emissions, but that's an intensity target. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so this audience, probably more than any other audience, is going to understand that getting a, challenge, getting a target like that set for a company of cargo size and complexity is no small thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we can imagine just how hard that was. But, uh, and you notice that that's in line with the Paris Agreement. Right. At the same time, all the scientists I speak to, I'm sure it's the same for you, they say, nowhere near good enough. You know, so you pulled off this thing, this, it's an, an, an amazing feat, and yet the rest of the world is saying, good start, nowhere near good enough, you've got to do much better. So, you know, I'm, I'm interested, like, I guess, partly on a personal level, mm. how does that feel, but also longer term, like, how, how far can Cargill go in really reigning in missions beyond those targets? Yeah. So, wow. Um, First of all, Cargill's purpose is to be the leader in nourishing the world in a safe, responsible, sustainable way. We have long um, been focused on providing safe, affordable food to people who need to eat all around the world. And we believed that was good. And it was. And it is. But more than ever, we now know we also have to do it as sustainably as possible. And so as we started to dig into, okay, what does that mean for our scope one and two, and then more extensively our scope three, it was really challenging. In fact, it was really scary because one of our core values is our word is our bond. And when you're 155 years old and you've worked with this premise that our word is our bond, to make a commitment and not, then not to be entirely clear about how are we gonna get there is pretty frightening. So, the team came together and we said, look, there's no choice. And oh, by the way, we have an opportunity in Cargill and an obligation to lead. And so I'm super proud. Personally, you asked, how does it feel personally? First, my first um, emotion is pride. I'm super proud that we were able to make the commitment. My second emotion is fear because I don't know exactly how we're going to, to achieve the commitment. Um, but I would say thirdly, I feel a tremendous amount of confidence because we have a really remarkable team at the table who's working on you know, all of the things that we can do. Scope one and two, obviously a little more obvious, a little more within our control. Our scope three is farmers and ranchers. Our scope three is food companies. One of the biggest sources of emissions in, the food, in our food supply chain is the heat that is used to heat frying oil for french fries in fast food restaurants. Okay, how do we control that? What, what do we need to do there? 
And so it means that we need to bring in all kinds of science and technology, which I know, Jim, you have a, an affinity for, and, and, and think differently about the relationship we have with all of those players along the supply chain. I'm super optimistic that we can get to where we need to be. Um, uh, but I also will tell you that it means that, again, we have to get a whole lot of voices around the table. There has been some conversation around, you know, and some voices that have said, Cargill, you operate in South America. You operate in Brazil and soy in particular. You need to pull out of those supply chains because they're unsustainable. And that's an approach. We could do that. It's not the choice that we've made. We believe we have to stay in and that we actually have to drive results, drive change from within the supply chain by working to influence and impact all along the way. So that brings me nicely to another question that I'm interested in. So Cargill made a pledge about deforestation. Did, mm -hmm. 2014, was that when the pledge got 2016. made? 2016. 2016. The pledge was, I believe, to end deforestation in the supply chain by 2020. Mm -hmm. And Cargill said uh, last year that you would not be able to meet that pledge. Uh, I would love, I'm sure everyone would love to better understand, like, what, like, why were you not able to meet that pledge? Yeah. So it goes back to, you know, it's, it, it actually informs a little bit of the concern and the fear that we had about making our scope three commitments because we'd made this big pledge. It actually was 2014, you were right. Um, and we had said, you know, we're gonna try to, our understanding of the pledge was have deforestation on our supply chains by 2020 and eliminate it by 2030. Time marched on, we made really good progress in our palm supply chains, we made very, very good progress in our cocoa supply chains. Soy was the area that we uh, didn't make the progress that we needed to, very frankly. We weren't alone, the industry hasn't made progress either. Um, but the reality is that we made more progress than we otherwise would have. And because we made the pledge, we've redoubled efforts to really engage in those um, uh, in those supply chains where we have the most critical need. One of the things that we're doing is we have created a forest panel and we've invited unusual voices to the table to come and advise Cargill, NGOs, academics, business people to come to the table and advise Cargill about what do we need to do to make an impact specifically in our soy supply chains. Great, and so we're gonna go to sidebar for some questions, but. I just want to get one more in. Yeah. Just, can you tell us quickly, what is it about soy? Why was it so hard? Soy is hard because there are tens of thousands of producers. There are hundreds of players. It's a commodity supply chain. The marketplace hadn't represented or recognized the value that can come from a more sustainable approach. And we were not able to push that um, understanding back into the supply chain. In addition, the reality is in Brazil, Brazil has some of the strongest sustainability laws anywhere in the world, and in Brazil, land conversion is legal. There's a requirement that farmers, in order to convert land, have to leave a portion of their land unconverted, a reserve, if you will, but it's a legal activity. And so how do we think about the legality in the face of concerns over what the impact will be on, on the planet and the sustainability impacts? And so how do we navigate that, which also brings in the whole conversation around policy and um, governments and how they can influence as well. Okay, thank you. So over to my colleagues, Heather and Sarah, with questions. Hi, Hello. Heather. Hello. Hi. So Ruth, I know that uh, your background, you come from a farming family. I do. And um, so the, there's one of the questions that's come up is how is Cargill working, specifically working with beef ranchers and farmers to promote soil health? And um, you know, how can you position this as an economic opportunity for that? I mean, we know in the United States, the, the farming community is, 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 is hurting. How can this be an opportunity for them to take this and use it as a way of, of, of better livelihood? Yeah, thanks, Heather. Yeah, so I'm really fortunate because I grew up on a farm in Northern California. Um, I'm a fifth generation family farmer and uh, my niece is actually the sixth generation. She's actively farming with my brother right now. Um, so I have a real passion and enthusiasm for agriculture and for farmers. I also believe that farmers actually are the most, um, they, they have every incentive to be stewards of the land and water because their desire is not only to use the land and water for productive purposes, but also to pass that land back onto their next generation. 
so they have no disincentive to destroy the land. I don't think farmers always, I mean, farmers also adapt technology very quickly when they can see that the reward outweighs the risk. So as we work with farmers and ranchers, we work with them to deploy more sustainable agricultural practices, including regenerative agriculture, that's a big kind of term right now. But what it means is practices like no-till and um, crop rotation and putting cover crops on their fields, um, which actually helps with water quantity and quality as well as soil health. What we know from some of the pilots that we've done and the, the learnings that we're already starting to discover is that in many ways those more sustainable agricultural practices are actually more productive. And they allow the farmer to reduce the cost of inputs that he has to um, spend in order to produce a crop with the same level of yield. Understandably, you know, there's this whole concept around 40 chances, where a farmer in his lifetime has 40 seasons to plant and harvest a crop. And if you take a risk that, that outweighs the potential reward during one of those 40 years, it can negatively impact your, your production, your income, your family's livelihood. And so going to farmers and working with them, understanding their concerns, and then working with um, other institutions to address some of those concerns is really a critical approach. Another question? Oh, goody, okay. <laughs> Uh, so th there's another one that's floated around. What role will technology, uh, be it satellite imagery or ag tech, play in helping Cargill make its commitments? I love this idea about technology and agriculture. Um, I said that farmers have adopted and adapted technology pretty rapidly over you know, many, many decades. Um, but I had the opportunity to see technology, satellite imagery, GPS coordinates firsthand. Um, I was in West Africa visiting our cocoa, um, some of our cocoa farmers. Uh, we have a cocoa business in Ivory Coast and Ghana. And I went out to one of the co-ops that we work with. So we work with about 140 co-ops in Ivory Coast. And each of those co-ops have about 1,000 farmers each. So you can do the math and you can see that's a huge amount of people that we have the opportunity to work with and to influence. Each of those farmers operate a, a plot of land that's about two hectares, which is not very big, and there's very little technology. We have um, employees who go out and map the field, that farm size, by walking and, and gathering GPS coordinates around the field. We do that about 150,000 times. And then we use that information about where the field is in conjunction with where protected areas are, as well as demographic information that we collect from farmers at the time to better understand what are the potential risks of a specific farmer as it relates to um, uh, human rights and child labor. And then we overlay AI with all of that information to give us some insights so that we can actually have an impact. And so farmers that maybe have a higher risk of uh, deforestation, we'll go and work with them specifically to help them understand what's critical as it relates to protecting the forest. Farmers that have a higher risk potentially because of the demographics of their family um, around child labor, we go and work with them, helping them to understand the importance of education and then ensuring that there's a school for their children to attend. So I love the use of technology, yes, because it helps us to know that ag is how we can feed a growing planet within planetary boundaries, how we can protect land and water, we can reduce carbon emissions, but I also love it because it helps us to work with um, farmers and women, especially in developing parts of the world, to improve their, their standard of living, to really improve their lives and their livelihood, and that I think is a really compelling story. Great, Ruth. Thank you so much for coming here and, and being open about the challenges that you face. We really appreciate it. And uh, this is just the beginning of the conversation. I'm really looking forward to continuing it and hearing about yeah. this work evolves. Thanks, Jim. We, right. we really appreciate green business engagement in the whole food and egg space. So thank you. Great.